Greetings and welcome to Mystery Babylon Radio on Wednesday, the 6th oh, of November. I'm sorry, Walt. My mic was muted. My okay. apologies. You got it, Tom. My apologies to your and, listeners. And welcome to the broadcast. Yes, thanks, Walt. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And Walt has asked me to come and do a series of broadcasts on the falsehood of futurism. And last week, or rather in previous weeks, we read and discussed the Jesuit oath, the oath of the militia of the Pope, and how they are destined by whatever means to destroy the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was literally fueled with the belief that the papacy was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And that it's only been about three generations of Christians that have believed otherwise. The last three generations of Christians have been taught something contrary to what all the Protestant Reformers, to the man, believed. Now, what do they believe that is different from the Protestant Reformers? Literally, that the Pope is not the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible, but that Antichrist is a future entity to to arrive upon the scenes of history in the long-distant future, or rather just seven years or three and a half years, as the case may be, whether you believe in pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation period of time. In other words, seven years, roughly, before Christ's return. Now, I call this futurist belief the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And I hope my listeners were here last week when we read Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, how by the reading of the book of Jeremiah, Daniel learned that there would be 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And that through that revelation, God had something with which to work. Daniel was a a willing and, and repentant Israelite and God literally called him to prophesy the coming of Messiah. Now, we've read Daniel's prayer, and now we're going to begin in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. Now he says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee For thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, the archangel Gabriel is going to describe to Daniel the vision. The angel is going to describe to Daniel a 490-year period of time. It has a definite beginning. It has a definite ending. This 490-year period, the angel refers to as 70 weeks. 70, uh, we all know that a week consists of seven periods of time. This is 70 times 7, or 490 years. Now, why the angel uses this method to describe a 490-year period is... Simply a convention that I can't explain. But in other, 
have all Bible theologians, all uh, prophecy teachers, all agree that this 70-week period of time represents 490 literal years. So far as I know, there's no contention in the Christian world about the interpretation of this portion of the prophecy. But there's great and grave misunderstanding about the end of this prophecy. And this is what we're here to discover to Walt's listeners. He says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So in 490 years, God is going to deal with Daniel's people. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And who were they? The Jews in Babylonian captivity. And the prophecy also includes the holy city, Jerusalem. And in the end of this 490-year period, or during this 490-year period, God is going to finish the transgression and to, to make an end of sins. How? By simply washing them away, right? And to make reconciliation for iniquity. We know that Christ reconciled us to God, did he not? It was iniquity that stood between us and the Father, and it was Christ who reconciled us and bore our iniquities on his own body and paid our punishment. And it says, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. In, in this language, the angel is telling Daniel that Christ's heavenly kingdom is going to be open to all those who will enter it. And that kingdom will never end. That is everlasting righteousness. The kingdom of Christ is everlasting, and it is righteous. And he also says, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, what does he mean by to seal up the vision and the prophecy? We all know that when a prophecy is or, or a, a, a scroll <clears throat> A scroll or a prophecy is written and complete. It's rolled up and then sealed. Okay? What we're literally talking about is that during this 490 years, all of these things that, that the angel has told Daniel that will happen, bringing an end of transgression, an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, will be sealed up in 490 years. Now, does that mean that somehow it won't be complete before it's sealed up? In other words, that there may be a portion of what the angel had prophesied to happen within this 490 years that just simply <clears throat> didn't happen on time, and that it must that the prophecy must be unsealed once again so that the vision and the prophecy can be finished? That runs counter to common sense. And there's nothing in this prophecy that indicates that the, that the prophecy will have to be opened up again in order to finish some unfinished business that the angel has just prophesied to have been completed in that 490-year period. Now, there's one last thing the angel says, and to anoint the most holy. Who is the most holy? It's Jesus, of course, and he was anointed by the one sent for that purpose, John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world... That makes him the most holy, doesn't it? That he was so holy and righteous, sinless, that he could bear upon his own body our iniquities, our transgressions, 
and reconcile us to God by sacrificing himself as a lamb on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, as did Abraham before him, Isaac, or Jacob. Now, this is the prophecy. It's to be sealed up in 490 years. Once a prophecy is fulfilled, there's no need to re-fulfill any portion of that prophecy. And we must believe that God fulfilled this prophecy, because in him is no error, and in him is no guile. Now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The city shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So now we're told that there will be a specific starting point for this 490-year clock to start ticking. That 490-year clock will start ticking at the com- going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And the, 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 real, the real intent of this time clock is to herald the coming of the Messiah. Okay, this prophecy is all about the Messiah. It's not about anybody else, despite what you've been taught in your churches. It says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be, now remember, we're still talking about 70 weeks total, 490 years. God is going to break up these 490 years into three consecutive time periods with no gap in between. Okay, the first time period of this 490 years, or these 70 weeks, they were, there will first be seven weeks. Now, we're going to do a little math, real simple additions. If you have a piece of paper and pencil... I want you to write on one line, seven weeks equals 49 years. After all, a week is seven days, and seven periods of seven days is 49 days. But we know that this is speaking of years. So seven times seven weeks is 49 years. Seven weeks equals 49 years. That's what you write on the top line of your paper. Seven weeks equals 49 years. This is the first period of the three divisions of this 70-week period of time, or 490 years. Now, immediately after that, the angel says, he says, he says, there shall be seven weeks and three score, and two weeks. Now, don't let this confuse you. This is just the way they spoke in those days. Most people don't understand what a score is. A score is 20. So three scores would be 60. Now, today we would describe 60 as six tens, Okay. Well, back then, they described 60 as three score, since a a score is 20, plus two, okay? Three score and two weeks. In other words, 62 weeks. So the second period, right beneath, immediately below, on a separate line, 62 weeks, Times 7 equals 434 years. So the second line, right beneath where you wrote 7 weeks equals 49 years, you should write 62 weeks equals 434 years, because 62 times 7 equals 434 years. Now let's add up those two divisions. So draw a line under the two and add them up. 
simple addition. What you have in total with the seven weeks and the 62 weeks is 69 weeks. And if you add the years, 49 years for the first period, 434 years for the second period, you have a total of 483 years. So 69 weeks equals 483 years. So on your paper on the top line, the first division of weeks is 7 weeks, or 49 years. The second line should be 62 weeks plus equals 434 years. Adding them together with a line drawn underneath, you get 69 weeks equals 483 years. Now, remember, the prophecy is for 490 years, and it concerns Daniel, it concerns his people, it concerns Jerusalem, and it calls for the coming of Messiah and the putting an end of sin and the opening of the kingdom of Christ. So, if the two divisions together, the first period and the second period, equal 69 weeks and 483 years, we know that there is one week left to go. 69 weeks is one shy of 70 weeks. 483 years is seven years shy of 490 years. So we literally have three, this 490-year period, or this 70-week period, divided up into three segments, consecutive segments. First, seven weeks, then 62 weeks, equals 69 weeks, and then one week, the final week the 70th week of Daniel. The time clock starts at the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem, and it includes the coming of Messiah the Prince. That's Jesus Christ. First, there'll be seven weeks of years, then 62 weeks of years, and during this period, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. So, for 483 years, Jerusalem will be in the rebuilding, and trouble will characterize that period. Now, there is one period of years left to go. That is one week. Now, Daniel says in chapter 9, verse 26, he says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. In other words, crucified. We know this because we read the scripture and know that he was that he was crucified. Now, first of all, we're talking about the three score and two weeks. But don't forget, before the three score and two weeks, there were seven weeks or four hundred or, or rather forty nine years. So literally, we are talking about Messiah coming after not just the three score and two weeks, but after 69 weeks. Again, he says, Know therefore and understand that from going forth to the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, the first period. Right after that, another 62 weeks, during that time, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Now, we're at the end of the 69th week, because it says, and after the three score and two weeks, or rather, it's literally saying, we know by understanding that seven weeks came before, this passage could literally read, and after 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now listen, if it's after the 69th week that Messiah shall be cut off and crucified, logic indicates, and we need nothing else but logic to indicate, that his cutting off, his crucifixion must come during the 70th week. 
Look carefully at Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. It says, and after two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So it must literally mean that after 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Again, if it's after the 69th week, it must occur during the 70th week. Logic won't have it any other way. We know that there's only one week after the 69th week, after the 483rd year. There's only seven years remaining. And it is after those 483 years that the seventh, uh, the seventieth week begins. After the sixty-ninth week, the seventieth week begins. Now we're all told by our pastors, and have been told for the last three generations, that there's a parenthetical gap of two thousand years between the sixty-ninth and seventieth week. But what does the Bible say? It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That means after the 69th week, during the 70th week, Messiah will be cut off. So it was Jesus cut off. The Messiah was cut off during the 70th week. Now, how do, how do we get what we've been taught in the church is about a future 70th week of Daniel? You ever hear, hear anybody talk about seven years of great tribulation? Well, look, that's where they get this whole idea of a future seven-year period of time. But logic simply won't have it. Messiah was cut off during that 70th week. And as we continue to read, we'll find out that he was cut off in the middle of that 70th week. Literally three and a half years within that 70th week. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. In other words, during the 70th week, <clears throat> Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Yes, he died for all of us who will receive him. And it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the sanctuary, the temple. Now, who is this prince that shall come? History records that in 70 A.D., Prince Titus came with the Roman 10th Legion and destroyed and burned Jerusalem and the temple and left not one stone upon the other of that temple. The prophecy that Jesus prophesied came to pass in 70 A.D. when Prince Titus the Roman of the Roman Empire came with his hordes, and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And it continues, and it says, And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Jerusalem was desolated. And as a matter of fact, Jesus, in prophesying the destruction of the temple, when he prayed over Jerusalem, he said, Your house is left unto you desolate. In other words, God isn't in it anymore. It's desolate. He, Jesus knew that the Jews were going to reject Christ as the Messiah. That they would not know the time of their visitation because they did not understand the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And their house, their temple, not God's temple, their temple would be left unto them desolate. And literally it was. Now, in verse 27, and here is where the deception takes place. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Remember, after the 69th week... Messiah will be cut off. That means during the 70th week, he will be cut off. But he shall confirm the covenant for one week, seven years. Who is it speaking of? 
can't be anybody but Jesus. Now, people say, no, it's the prince that shall come. No, the article of that parenthetical phrase is, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And if we drop down to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, and he shall confirm the covenant. Well, he cannot describe people. The people of the prince that shall come. And it's not referring to the prince that shall come because he didn't confirm any covenants. He simply destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. Prince Titus destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. He didn't confirm any covenant. Jesus did. So who is the identity of this he in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? My guess is 99.999% of the listeners have always been taught by their theologians, by their pastors, that this he referred to here is the Antichrist. That the Antichrist shall come and confirm a covenant with many for one week, a seven-year period of time. But we're not talking about a future week. You see, that's the lie. The 70th week of Daniel is completely and perfectly fulfilled in Messiah. There is not one mention in all of this prophecy about any Antichrist. And we are not to be confused by this short little parenthetical phrase that says in verse 26, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Because all of that is already revealed in history of 70 A.D. So that portion is over. And I assert to my listeners tonight that the 70th week of Daniel is over, too. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he, Christ, shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. How did Christ cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease? Remember, Jesus was crucified on the high holy day. Jesus was crucified on the very day that the high priest of Israel was to take the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and make reconciliation for all the sins of Israel. But what happened? When Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, It is finished! He was talking about this prophecy, Daniel's prophecy. It is finished. My, con my covenant in my blood is confirmed. And he gave up the ghost. And immediately, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. And you must know that when that heavy veil was ripped from top to bottom, it was God who ripped it. Well, why would God rip the veil of the temple? Because it had no purpose anymore. The house was desolate. The lamb, the real lamb of Israel, was hanging on the cross just outside the city. And it was that sacrifice that God accepted as the atonement for Israel. So what about the blood that the high priest of Israel was about to take into the, ho the Holy of Holies and sprinkle? He couldn't do it because the veil of the temple was ripped and the veil had fallen open and exposed the Holy of Holies. And we all know that the temple worship, because of that missing veil, Temple worship ceased. That's how God called. That's how Messiah, in the midst of the week, in the midst of the 70th week, caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he became the sacrifice and the oblation and rendered Temple Mount worship over with. 
permanently to to offer any more sacrifices is to reject the sacrifice that Christ made on that cross. To make any more animal sacrifices to say, it is not finished. Any more sacrifices to say, the vision is not sealed up. The prophecy is not sealed up. And we must have a do-over. Because remember, if there is anything called the future 70th week of Daniel, it's not the authentic. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, completely and perfectly. The Lamb of Almighty God caused, confer, first confirmed the covenant in His blood, and then caused the sacrifice and the oblations to cease when He fulfilled that covenant. If anybody tells you there's a future 70th week of Daniel, they are liars. If anybody tells you there's a parenthetical gap of 2,000 years from the, between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel, they are liars. No apologies. They are liars, and the sons of liars. Anybody with eyes to see, with any knowledge at all of history, with any knowledge of the Bible, can see plainly that the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, speaks of no one but the Messiah. This prophecy is about no one but the Messiah, and Daniel, and Daniel's people, and Jerusalem. 490 years, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, thy holy city, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. No one is to open that vision and prophecy again except to understand its fulfillment in Christ the Messiah. In the midst of the week, after three and a half years of his ministry, his ministry began after the 69th week. On the very first day of the 70th week, the Most Holy was anointed by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. This is my beloved Son. This is the Messiah. And he fulfilled. He confirmed the covenant. Listen, you can't confirm a covenant unless it already exists. Now, how is this future Antichrist going to confirm a covenant that does not yet exist? I've been taught in my church that he's going to make a covenant, a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. It's all a lie, every bit of it. Because Jesus fulfilled this. He confirmed his covenant in his blood, not the blood of lambs and goats, not the blood of lambs and goats that cannot wash away sins, in a Temple Mount worship that was a type of the true, and he was the true. And it was in his blood that he was confirming the covenant, doing away with the animal sacrificial covenant. By fulfilling it, he did away with it. In the midst of the week, in the midst of the week, one week, the only week left to be fulfilled of Daniel's 70th week. Those 70 weeks are broken into three periods. First, seven weeks of 49 years, 62 weeks of 480, uh, 434 years. Together makes 69 weeks, 483 years, and then you begin the 70th week of Daniel by the anointing of the Most Holy. Three and a half years later, he caused the sacrifice and the oblations to cease after confirming his covenant, fulfilled it in his own blood. In the one week, in the 70th week, in the third division of those 70 weeks. Sixty-nine weeks had already passed 
before Christ's seven-year ministry began. And he fulfilled every tenet of this prophecy. Jesus fulfilled every tenet of this prophecy. He confirmed the covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease by giving up his own life. Well, the obvious question is, somebody would ask, well, what happened to the other three and a half years? Well, 50 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, he brought the Comforter called the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Most Holy. That is, the Spirit of Christ. And Jesus, in the Spirit, fulfilled the last seven years of, uh, of the last three and a half years of that seven-year covenant. Remember, it wasn't just about Messiah. It was about Daniel and Daniel's people and Jerusalem. Messiah was cut off in the midst of the week. There's still three and a half years to go. And through the Spirit of Christ, Christ continued to witness through his apostles that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And we see three and a half years after Christ's crucifixion that, the, that Stephen finally, before the Sanhedrin, convinced them that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And we know that he convinced them that the Holy Spirit convicted their hearts and convinced them that they had indeed wickedly slain their own Messiah because it says that they rent their clothes. They rent their clothes in grief. But instead of getting down on their knees before Stephen and confessing that Jesus was their lamb and that Daniel's 70 weeks was over, that the prophecy was fulfilled and sealed, Stephen shut him up. Repentance never came to Jerusalem. Repentance never came to the Jews. Yes, there were Jews who were saved. They're in the kingdom, a kingdom which exists from that point till now. Everybody in the Christian world says, when Jesus' kingdom comes, when Jesus' kingdom comes, Jesus' kingdom came when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and that kingdom has been open for new members ever since. <coughs> and no, <coughs> you don't have to sign a baptismal card to become a member of that church. Christ adds you to that church. All those who are called and chosen, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And we've been coming to him for 2,000 years. The kingdom has been ours ever since. Christ is our king. And we are under his protection and his law and his covenant. We are washed in his blood. He has brought an end of our iniquity. He has reconciled us to God. But the Jews, as a nation, rejected him. And instead of falling down on their face in repentance, they stoned Stephen. They stoned the messenger. Now, what about these Jews that rejected Jesus Christ? They're still looking for a Messiah, aren't they? Well, they're going to get one. But it's not going to be Jesus. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 is talking about the Messiah, Jesus, and no one else. And Jesus shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, Jesus shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, Jesus shall make it desolate, shall make the temple desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, what is the consummation? I'll let my listeners decide. Many people say, no, if the consummation ended in 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed. But I don't believe that's what it's talking about. I believe the consummation is the consummation of the world. 
And it says, for the overspreading of abominations, Jesus shall make it, the temple, desolate, even until the coming of the judgment. And that determined, the judgment, shall be poured upon the desolate, those who have not Christ. So, by this, what are we to believe about this future temple that's about to be built in Jerusalem? Will it be holy unto the Lord? What about the animal sacrifices the Jews are preparing to make? And all the Christian and Protestant world in the United States is trying to help Jerusalem, trying to help the Jews build their temple and begin animal sacrifices again. Why? To reject Jesus one more time? To confirm their rejection of Jesus and begin animal sacrifices again? Abominable sacrifices and oblations which cannot wash away sin? I believed all these lies for 50 years of my life. Common sense prevails now. The simple language of Daniel's 70th week prophecy is very well understood by me, by the grace of Almighty God. Because if it were not for His grace, I'd still believe the lie, the greatest lie that's been told since the Garden of Eden. Because now the whole world is not looking for Christ. They're looking for Antichrist. So the real Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, just as the Protestant Reformers said, all they have to do is come up with somebody who will sign a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. And in the midst of that, after three and a half years, break that treaty, and the whole world will believe he's Antichrist. And then the real Antichrist will come riding into Jerusalem and will be accepted by Jew and Protestant and Catholic alike. Like I said, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. The great delusion. The great delusion. The strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Okay, I've run out of time. We'll continue where we left off on next week, next Wednesday on the program. Thank you, Walt, for allowing me here on Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. I'll see you next week. Again, my name's Tom Press, host of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stop and see me sometime.